Maybe you can tell me about the region of Donbass. I mentioned that nationalism and principle of nationalism is the principle of uh, making the political borders to coincide with ethnic and cultural borders. Mm -hmm. And that's that's how the maps of of, uh, many East European countries had been drawn in the 19th and 20th century. On that that principle, uh, Donbass, where the majority constituted uh, by the beginning of the 20th century were Ukrainians, was considered to be Ukrainian, and was claimed in the middle in, in, in the middle of this revolution and revolutionary wars and civil wars by uh, Ukrainian government. Mm-hmm. But Donbass became a site, one of the key sites in the Russian F- Empire of early industrialization. In its, with its mining industry, with its metallurgical industry. So what that meant was that people from other parts of, not Ukraine, but other parts of the Russian Empire congregated there. That's, that's where jobs were. That's how Khrushchev and his family came, came to Donbass. The, the family of Brezhnev overshoot a little bit. They got to the industrial enterprises in, in, in the city of uh, uh, Kamenske near, near uh, Dnipro, the, the place, the city that was called Dnipropetrovsk. So those were Russian peasants moving into the area in, in uh, looking for, for, the, for the job. And um, by the, 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 the population became quite mixed. Ukrainians still constituted the majority of the population, but not necessarily in the towns and in the cities. And culturally, the place was becoming more and more Russian as the result of that of that moment. So, well, apart from the Crimea, uh, Donbas was the part of Ukraine where the ethnic Russians were uh, the, mm, mm, the the biggest group. They were not the majority, but they were. Very, very big and significant group. For example, in the city of Mariupol, that was all but destroyed in the course of the last of the last two years. Um, the uh, ethnic Russians constituted uh, over forty percent of the population. Right. So um, that's not exactly part of Donbas, but that gives you that 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 gives you general idea. Now the story of Donbas uh, and what happened now is is multidimensional, and this ethnic composition is just one part of the story. Another very important part of the story is uh, uh, economy, and uh, uh, Donbas is a classical rust belt, and we know what happens with the cities that were part of the first or second wave of industrialization in the United States and globally. You know about social problems that exist in those places. So Donbass is probably the most dramatic and tragic case of implosion of the rust belt, with the mines not anymore producing the sort of the, uh, and at the acceptable price, the coal that they used to produce. is people look, uh, losing jobs, with the politicians looking for subsidies as opposed to trying very unpopular, unpopular measures of uh, dealing something and and bring bring new money and new investment into the region, so all of that all of that become part uh, of the story that made made it easy for uh, Russia for the Russian Federation to destabilize the situation. Um, we have interviews with Mr. Girkin, who is saying that he was the first who pulled the trigger and, and fired the shot. In, in that war, he became the Minister of Defense in the, in the uh, Donetsk People's Republic. You look at the Prime Minister, he is another person with a uh, uh, Moscow residency permit. Um, um, so you, you see key figures in, the, in those positions uh, at the start and the beginning, not being Russians from Ukraine, but being being Russians from Russia and Russians Russians from Moscow, closely connected to the to the government structure and the intelligence structure and so on. So that is that is the start and the beginning. But uh, the the way how how it exploded, the way it did. Was also a combination of of the economic and ethnocultural and linguistic factors. So for Putin, the war in Donbass and even in 2022 is a defensive war. 
against what the Ukrainian government is doing against ethnically Russian people of Donbass. Is that fair to say? Well, how he describes it. What what we see this is certainly this is certainly the argument, right? This is certainly the argument, and uh, a pretext uh, because what. Uh, we see there is that there would be no, and, and there was no independent mobilization in Crimea either, in Crimea or in Donbass, without Russian presence. Uh, without Russian occupation de facto of the Crimea, there would be no, and, and there was no before, uh, uh, at least in the previous five to six years, any mass mobilizations of Russians. There was none of such mobilizations in in Donbass before before Gherkin and other people with military with with um, parts of military units showed up there. So it is it is a it is an excuse. You you've been to Ukraine. Mm -hmm. You know that uh, Russian language is not uh, persecuted in Ukraine. And um, if you've not been to Donbass, it would be diff or to the Crimea, it would be difficult to find one single Ukrainian school. Not that they didn't exist at all, but it would take quite an effort mm -hmm. for you to find it. Or sometimes even to hear Ukrainian language outside either of the institutions or or the or the uh, farmers' market. So um, that that's that's the reality. That that's the reality that is clear, that is visible. So uh, imagine uh, under those conditions and context that someone is is uh, persecuting um, uh, ethnic Russians or Russian speakers. Um, one to believe in something like that. One important precondition is never to step step your foot in Ukraine. 